Welcome uh, everyone. My name is uh, Marta Heimes. I am a researcher at the Leuven Centre for Global Governance, uh, study and a PhD uh, candidate at the Faculty of Law of um, KU Leuven. And I'll be talking to you uh, today about the South China Sea issue. And uh, I've chosen uh, to do so from the perspective of, of lawfare. And to that end, I've uh, entitled the presentation uh, as follows, towards the establishment of a new international legal order for the oceans with Chinese characteristics. Um, so the approach I'm choosing for, for this presentation is the concept and notion of lawfare. So in order to be able um, to uh, enlighten you on that in uh, the South China Sea sphere, I would first have to elaborate a bit on the premise and concept of this notion of lawfare. Um, after which, uh, for uh, the sake of, of clarity and um, consistency, I'll give a very brief uh, overview, overview of the current state of affairs in the South uh, China Sea. Um, and then delving more into this whole lawfare notions, uh, notion, I will um, focus on the one hand on selected uh, PRC operations in the South China Sea, which according uh, to me might uh, demonstrate a use uh, of lawfare and um, the same uh, will be uh, done um, when it comes to uh, China's uh, South China Sea policy in the international sphere and how that could uh, entail a lawfare aspect. And to conclude, I will then try to um, formulate a response from a rule of law perspective in the sense of how um, should one go about and, and react um, to um, this use of lawfare. Um, so the concept uh, of lawfare, uh, for the sake of this presentation, uh, I will be using the definition um, as presented by Charles Dunlap in his 2001 um, essay, uh, which uh, defines lawfare as and I quote, the strategy of using or misusing the law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve an operational objective, unquote. To be clear, uh, in this context, of course, of the South China Sea and the PRC's foreign policy, the operational objective here would be um, asserting, uh, substantiating, and ultimately also consolidating uh, China's claims to resources and maritime territory in the South China Sea. To give you an idea, um, lawfare or legal warfare tools are manifold and can take different uh, forms. It can uh, be about the use of domestic legislation. It can uh, be um, issuing statements that present uh, a certain position. Uh, it can also be uh, the, the production of legal scholarship, which presents a position uh, that favors or, or an interpretation that favors the states uh, in question's um, position and so on and so forth. But for this uh, talk, I will be focusing on the use of international law, which has also been identified as one of the tools of legal warfare um, as uh, um, a way um, to um, achieve this uh, objective. And now when it comes to the PRC, actually, um, there has been quite a history of, of this notion of, of lawfare, uh, much more so than in what you would call Western uh, legal uh, doctrine and, and policy. Um, already in uh, well before um, uh, the year counting, uh, around 500 to 400 BC, it's not entirely certain, um, Sun Tzu in his Art of War uh, held that, quote, to subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill, unquote. So basically, somehow preferring or, or, uh, or, or uh, rather um, arguing in favor of uh, an alternative to kinetic warfare and physical confrontation between uh, armies. Um, more contemporarily, in 1999, former President uh, Jiang Zemin um, he urged China to, quote, adapt to using uh, international law as a weapon to defend the interests of our state, unquote. And in the same vein, or in the same year, rather, um, a military uh, strategy book was published by uh, two Chinese colonels, which was entitled Unrestricted Warfare. And this manual, in fact, identifies international law as one of the alternative means 
to avoid direct military confrontation with China's strategic opponents. And then in 2003, you could say that this notion of legal warfare became, became codified uh, Chinese policy when um, it was included in a decision by the CCP Central Committee and the Chinese Central Military Commission who codified the notion of three warfares as uh, Chinese policy. Now, the three warfares, they consist of psychological warfare, media warfare and legal warfare or lawfare. I unfortunately do not have time to, to delve in, uh, into more detail into the three warfares, but so we will be working here with uh, legal warfare. Um, before then uh, turning to how China might be using uh, lawfare uh, in and around the South China Sea, a brief overview of the state of affairs. Um, you would expect that given the circumstances and um, the global crisis, the global health crisis uh, we are experiencing now, that uh, the world has other things uh, to deal with than the South China Sea. And that, well, you would think that there's a sort of, of calmness in the South China Sea. However, nothing less is true in the sense um, that uh, clashes between uh, vessels of the claimant states, but also uh, with uh, U.S. Navy ships in the region, um, continue to be um, very much uh, present. Um, I've just copy pasted some headlines of, of reports of, of, or uh, news reports, etc. on uh, these kinds of incidents. And just last week on April 3rd, there was an incident between um, a Chinese Coast Guard ship and a Vietnamese fishing vessel. You can imagine, and I will come back to that later, how the accounts on what actually happened uh, vary depending on um, which uh, countries' news sites or foreign ministry, uh, affair, ministry of foreign affairs sites to consult. But um, whatever may be, in any case, what happened is that in one way or another, the two vessels clashed um, and in the end, the Vietnamese fishing vessel uh, sunk. So um, a lot still going on, many clashes and, and, and incidents between uh, vessels uh, at sea uh, in the South China Sea and around the disputed features. Now, moving into um, lawfare, the notion of lawfare and, and how this uh, materializes on the ground, so from the operational level, um, I've chosen to highlight two aspects, uh, which on the one hand is China's so-called island building, uh, so in the context of land reclamation, and on the other hand, um, so-called uh, PRC law enforcement activities um, and the role of uh, maritime militia therein. Now, of course, the PRC's um, island building um, is very well uh, documented. Um, and what you see, obviously, it's not only the PRC, I should mention, it's other claimant states doing the same thing as well. Um, but for example, what you see here on the slide is um, satellite imagery from Fury Cross Reef, so one of the disputed features um, and the modifications it underwent between uh, uh, 2009 on the left hand side and uh, 2018 on the right hand side. Um, now, from a legal point of view, from the point of view of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, these kinds of artificial islands, they do not qualify as fully entitled islands and hence do not generate um, the full set of maritime zones which a fully entitled island would. Nor can these types of modifications elevate a uh, feature status to the status of a fully entitled, entitled island in order to then generate a full set of maritime claims. However, in practice, of course, these modifications, they do present irreversible uh, defait accompli, as you would say, which from a legal point of view um, significantly uh, complicate and even trump or might trump the assessment of the status of these features as islands, rocks or low tide elevations under UNCLOS, which is decisive for uh, the maritime zones and rights they can generate. And then a second aspect is the PRC's so-called law enforcement activities. So this is uh, within the framework of, for example, the clash uh, I've, I've briefly touched upon before between um, Chinese PR, uh, Coast Guard ships and, and, and other fishing vessels. Um, and what you see there is very much um, that these incidents are rooted in a different understanding of what the law 
is or should be. Um, in the sense that you also see uh, quite some clashes between PRC uh, vessels and US Navy uh, ships, which conduct so-called freedom of navigation operations. And there you see that the US approach is very much centered around this notion of freedom of navigation, whereas China is advocating a more strict reading of um, third states' navigational rights and activities in a coastal states' um, exclusive economic zone, uh, so in this case uh, China's uh, claimed uh, exclusive economic zone. But the constant uh, factor there is that basically by forcing some sort of interaction, um, the PRC then can claim that these uh, third state vessels were interfering with lawful activities of Chinese uh, ships and that as such the attention would be drawn to the illegality of the operations of these foreign um, vessels as not being uh, in line with the peaceful uh, uses of the sea as prescribed by UNCLOS and as operating in the Chinese exclusive economic zone without uh, prior Chinese uh, consent. This is also what you see in the responses by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs to all these uh, uh, incidents is that the tenor is always the same, um, that it's the other states who had violated uh, international law, Chinese law, and so on and so forth. And additionally, um, you see um, a new phenomenon uh, popping up um, in, in recent years is uh, these so-called maritime militias. And what you see is that the PRC is actually more and more um, deploying non-military uh, government agencies uh, and personnel who are then tasked uh, with uh, policing environmental and research man resource management control in the South China Sea. Um, and by doing so, um, China could arguably, in the case of incidents or clashes, claim the legal and moral high ground in the sense that it would be easier for China to then argue that it was that these um, civilian, if you wish, um, actors were operating lawfully and peacefully, whereas the others, uh, the other side of the incident, be it the U.S., Vietnam, or another state, was operating with its navy, which might complicate matters or tilt um, the balance in favor of um, China, uh, especially because it often also uses uh, fishing uh, vessels, so not even coast guard vessels, but fishing vessels. Um, that was for the operational level, so now more on, on the strategic level, if you wish. Um, the PRC's South China Sea policy uh, on the international plane. Um, you will probably be aware, or uh, at least you should be aware, of the South China Sea uh, arbitration case filed by the Philippines against China, which was concluded on the merits or decided on the merits in 2016. Um, China's uh, official line has from the very beginning in 2013 up till today been that these awards are null and void and do not bind uh, China. Um, basically uh, for a number of reasons, but the main one being that according to China, uh, the tribunal did not have uh, jurisdiction. Um, but um, what I would like to focus on here, especially in the context of lawfare, is um, a piece of legal scholarship which I think um, has gone uh, somewhat unnoticed um, where it shouldn't have. Um, because in 2018, the Chinese Society of International Law in the Chinese Journal of International Law published uh, a piece which was entitled The South China Sea Arbitration Awards, A Critical Study. I'm calling it a piece uh, because you could hardly call it an article because it's actually a 500 plus pages long analysis of uh, the arbitration awards. Um, it follows the structure of the awards and it dissects uh, every single aspect of the awards and presents a Chinese response, uh, if you wish, to the different elements of the case. Um, and you could even argue that in certain ways, through this uh, study, indeed, China seems to be using international law um, as a way to uh, reshape or reinterpret uh, the current law of the sea regime and then in particular the United Nations Convention on the law of the sea. To that end, I would um, like to give you two examples. 
um, which I've selected, uh, which on the one hand is uh, the regime of baselines under UNCLOS and the regime of uh, archipelagic states, and on the other hand, uh, the matter of jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. I promise I won't be uh, too technical. Um, when it comes to the regime of drawing baselines under UNCLOS, it suffices here to say that one of the main arguments of, uh, of positions of China is that the features in the South China Sea should be considered as a unit. And the advantage being that China could then, uh, under uh, its own interpretation, claim or draw an archipelagic baseline around these features as a unit, which in turn could result in potentially um, significantly larger spaces of uh, the maritime um, area around these features that China could uh, lay a claim on. Um, however, the uh, uh, arbitral tribunal in its, in its award dismissed um, this claim and rejected treating the features uh, as a unit. Um, I'm not going to delve into the reason why. Um, but in any case, the study, uh, on the other hand, also supports the treatment of uh, the features as a unit. However, creatively, it does so not by virtue of uh, UNCLOS, but by claiming that, and I quote, it is the customary international law regime of outlying archipelagos that should be applied, unquote. And hence, China is basically arguing it's not UNCLOS that should be applied, it's customary international law that should be applied. And the study then moves on to supposedly substantiating this claim by proving the existence of the two constitutive elements of customary international law, being on the one hand state practice and on the other hand opinion juris. Now, um, from my understanding and my reading, I think uh, both aspects uh, lack credibility and, and are flawed in many respects, but I won't go into detail there. But what you see very much um, in this case, but also throughout the study, is this focus on customary international law and state practice. And in that respect, of course, UNCLOS is, is, um, is um, a grateful victim and customary international law a willing tool, if you wish, considering the many uh, lacunae um, that UNCLOS has, which is due um, to um, the convention being negotiated by consensus, which resulted in a lot of vagueness in the final provisions. And then on the other hand, the dynamic nature of customary international uh, law and the role of state practice therein. And of course, that's for China is ideal to also include Chinese state practice in the formation of customary international um, law. And so you see how in this case, you feel and you sense that indeed these Chinese legal experts and scholars are very much aware that their argument does not stand ground under UNCLOS and hence they provide an alternative narrative based on customary international uh, law, specifically focusing on state uh, practice. And as such, they deem that they can claim an, quote, undeniable, unquote, customary international law status um, to this regime of baselines, where you would say that under a strict reading of UNCLOS would not be beneficial to China's case in this particular matter. On the matter of jurisdiction, then, that's another um, example of where, from a lawfare perspective, I think... Um, you might even speak of a misuse of the law, think of the definition that Dunlap uh, provided, in the sense that in order to make or substantiate the argument against jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, um, the critical study relies on case law of, amongst others, the uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, and it must be said, it is impressive to see um, the uh, analysis made of the case law of the ICJ in the sense that literally no stone, or in this case, um, case has been left unturned. However, what you see is that the conclusions drawn from these analyses, analyses of these cases are at times at odds with the correct application of the case law cited and also often make inaccurate analogies. And here I would like to give one example. Um, one of the main uh, arguments of, of China there is um, that the tribunal did not have jurisdiction because the Philippines would have unlawfully, illegally 
um, fragmented the dispute into different aspects, whereas the dispute should be considered as a whole. And following um, a Chinese reservation to UNCLOS, fall outside of the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. Um, and in order to substantiate that claim, um, the study, amongst other cases, relies on the legality of use of force case of the ICJ. However, um, a couple of things are, are remarkable in, in the following uh, uh, analysis they make, in the sense that, on the one hand, um, from time to time, they link certain paragraphs of the decisions of the cases with the words, therefore, and hence presenting it as if the ICJ drew a certain conclusion from a certain finding, whereas from a strict reading of um, the decision, you could not simply link these findings by the word therefore, and that there is no causal link, if you wish. Secondly, um, in the case of, of the legality of use of force, in my opinion, the analogy does not even stand um, because the subject matters at hand were completely and entirely different, so no analogy could even be made. And then third, and last but not least, um, the reason uh, why the ICJ in the legality of use of force case decided that there was no jurisdiction had in fact nothing to do with a supposed uh, unjustifiable fragmentation of the dispute. Rather, it was a temporal issue with the application um, of international uh, criminal law. And hence, the, the, the fragmentation of the dispute was not the reason um, why, uh, the why the uh, ICJ decided against jurisdiction, and hence the analogy uh, does, does not stand. So you could say here that indeed there is a misrepresentation or even a misuse of the law to defend uh, China's position. So what you can um, conclude from that, from this very brief uh, shortcut presentation, um, is that you see that the, pre the PRC is indeed presenting an alternative narrative to what it experienced to still be a very hegemonic, being US hegemonic, law of the sea regime of UNCLOS. And that it is presenting significant efforts in winning the legal hearts and minds of foreign uh, audiences in that respect. And this fits very well within uh, a quote uh, by the Chinese judge at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, who said that, quote, it is China's view that the UNCLOS Convention is only the first step towards the establishment of a new international legal order for the oceans, unquote. And now, of course, the question is, is this problematic? And if so, what should we do about it? And I think that especially the response or, or how we should deal uh, with this is twofold and one crucial preliminary aspect is the careful study and analysis of this PRC narrative but also of its very detailed uh, legal interpretations because obviously we all know the narrative of the South China Sea um, China has historic rights and so on and so forth but we should pay more attention to these um, documents like the critical study, which present actually an interpretation from a legal point of view. And it is the same Sun Tzu who I mentioned before, who said, know your enemy. I'm not saying in any way that China should be considered an, any, an, an enemy, but the point still is still valid. He says that we should make sure that we fully understand what is said, what is argued by China, in order to then in a second phase, if need be, unequivocally oppose and debunk misinterpretations and misuses of the law where they are um, present. I think this is crucial uh, for the maintenance of the international rule of law, but also for the maintenance of, in particular, then the rules-based maritime order and the preservation of unclosed the constitution of um, the oceans. I thank you very much for your attention. And please, if you have any further questions or comments, do not hesitate to reach out to me um, at the address indicated on uh, the screen.